to D&D Beyond. I am so excited today because if you're watching this, have you ever wanted to DM, to start DMing, to figure out how to find your own DM style and maybe design and publish some adventures? We're going to get into all of that and to talk about all those various sides of putting together an adventure for your players and making it the best it possibly can be. Please welcome Latia Jaquise. Hi, how are you doing? It's me. Hi, I am uh, very excited to be here. Hi, Amy. It's so good to see you. <laughs> it's so good to see you. Uh, in our conventionless world, this is how I get to actually meet and talk to people. Uh, but mm-hmm. y'all will know Latia from, first of all, uh, stepping back into the DM seat for this Sunday's season premiere of Rivals of Waterdeep. I want to say season 12. Yes. Season 12, yes. Uh, as well as, of course, uh, a longtime player, tabletop RPG creator, uh, wrote some mini adventures for our own website that I think those links mm-hmm. are running through chat uh, when Wild Hope was so. coming out a couple of years back. Yeah. Uh, the mods, as usual, are on top of it. And a contributor to the still mysterious but very exciting upcoming Critical mm-hmm. Role Call of the Nether Deep. Yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all oh I think boy. I'm allowed to ask about it yet, but I'm excited. Uh, so and you're wildly overqualified. Uh, and please answer all of my questions about everything. Um, but let's all right, start simple. Let's go. <laughs> uh, you, you have a wonderful interview with Todd on our channel where you talked a bit about sort of your path uh, back into the world of D&D. But for folks who might not be familiar, how did you end up as the sliding back into DM chair, Rivals of Waterdeep, the head? What brought you to all that stuff I just said? Where am I? How did I get here? Um, (laughs) So it all started. No, it's... (laughs) Um, It's been a weird, wild, and wacky two to three years. Um... I jumped back into the world of D&D through Critical Role, as a lot of people did, um, in 2016 when uh, they they were streaming their campaign one. Got back into D&D that way, um, played a couple games at some game shows, started uh, game shows, game stores. Wow, no. Uh, <laughs> I can do the writing. I can't do the, 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 the wording. Mm-mm. <laughs> But I started playing at some game stores, uh, which kind of transitioned into uh, both playing and running games for D&D Adventurers League, which then got me going to conventions, uh, running games to get to them. And then uh, somebody asked me if I wanted to write. And I said, yeah, maybe one day. And then uh, that kind of hit a dead end uh, because that was at the end. That was 2019. And then... Uh, we smoosh into 2020 where everything else happened. But 2020, despite all that, was a very full year. Um, I was community manager for the Indie Adventures League. I was asked to write Wild Mount Adventures for the Indie Beyond. I was asked to join the cast of Rivals of Waterdeep. And now that everybody knows that Netherdeep is out or coming out, the end of 2020 was when I was asked to contribute to that. So 2020 despite being a trash fire, was pretty cool behind the scenes. <laughs> it's honestly, every every silver lining that I hear about to something like this, I feel like it strengthens us all. Like, there are good things happening somewhere. Uh, yes. And, and we like to know that, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, with all that in context, and we will hope to, should it work out and be convenient, have you back to maybe talk when we can dive a little deeper, no pun intended, on Nether Deep. But yeah. for today, I want to talk about DMing, specifically because your path back in involved, I mean, DMing for Adventures League is no joke. Uh, mm-hmm. You're playing with a specific context of uh, people have, of course, they want to have a specific experience that's grounded in paying, you know, the rules matter, the outcomes matter. Uh, in a way Mm -hmm. that some of my like freewheeling home game, make it up as you go kind of play style is maybe not so appropriate for. How did you find what you liked as a DM? Uh, Really by just continuing to do it. Like, you know, you're not going to find what you like as a DM just by running one thing and then uh, being like, this is terrible. I'm never doing again. Or this is awesome. I'm going to do it forever. Like, there's a, you know, it's kind of a snowball effect. So um, 
what I liked about running for Adventurers League specifically was that I didn't have to think so much about what I had to plan because Adventures mm-hmm. League is is a little railroady in that, like you said, there's a a um a certain format that you have to get. You have a there's a time limit of of you know how long you, you have to run and and um for my brain, which very frequently finds it difficult to come up with new things, that was a very easy way for me to say, I can do this, I can DM and find out exactly what I liked about it. I love that because some folks might find, you know, it, it either intimidating or liberating to be like, here are the, the, the shape, here's the material to put across. Um, but what you're saying is essentially it helped you to unhook learning to sort of administer the game and put it into practice from the, I need to build this from the ground up side of it. Mm-hmm. Or even from the, um, even from the, uh, adventure book perspective because even the adventure books are you know this is what you want to accomplish in however many long sessions but adventure books it's so easy to go off the rails and you know if you don't know your players or if you don't know anything about the book or the content at large you're still a little stuck when they say no we don't want to go to thither we want to stay in hither or we want to take a break before we, you know, continue along the witch light path. So yeah, it's smaller, smaller chunks of DMing experience that I didn't have to plan anything extra for. Awesome. What do you feel like you learned or gained when you started trying, or if you already did, like the the other styles, like working from published material in a home game or just making your own thing up? Um, I learned that no matter what you do, uh, your players, uh, one, are going to go off script and (laughs) two, will support you regardless. Um, There's nothing wrong with uh, leaning on your players for information that you may not know because, you know, nobody, some people may expect, but nobody really expects all of us to read all of these <laughs> um every word of to, every book it's a lot. every word of every book front to back so um you know if you don't know anything there's no harm in that just ask somebody who's a bit more knowledgeable but also you are the dm and they trust that you're going to give them a good experience if you're a, a really good group like that and they're gonna kind of go with whatever you do so regardless of whether you're running something that is kind of pre-planned or whether you're going off script, it's like, just enjoy the ride because really they don't know what you're going to do and they don't know what you don't know. That's a great point. How, how was it different uh, starting to do stream DMing? Oh my goodness. Uh, even more intimidating because now you're running for your friends, which is still awesome, but now you're showing that to a bunch of people who, even in their best intentions, are going to criticize what you do. Um, in Rivals, you know, we we discourage backseating because our story is our story, but we still have people who are like, she shouldn't have been able to do this, or he shouldn't have been able to do that, and we're like, let us do what we're going to do. And at the start, that's a little disheartening because people become a little bit more interested in the mechanics than the story, but uh, we kind of learn to just kind of ignore that stuff. So it's a little bit more intimidating when you've got an audience, but if you're focused on your players and your story, then it's, you kind of end up kind of, all that stuff kind of like takes a, it starts to quiet. Um mm. You can just sort of put a put a volume down or a mute on that section of the the feedback, mm-hmm. uh, even when you understand that people might mean it constructively. It doesn't help you DM better. Um, exactly. And you know they don't all mean it constructively, but that's a separate exactly. thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's see. Uh, we have oh a great question uh, coming in from our mod Aaron Lar. What do you feel is a good ratio of prep time to play time? Ooh, interesting. Um, I would say 
So for, I'm, I'm going to put it into perspective for the premiere on Sunday. So um, we play about two hours. And uh, despite how long I have been fretting over what we're going to do, like how long I've been thinking about what is actually going to happen during the session, I'm probably going to give it about an hour, an hour and a half of actual sit down. This is what's happening. Um, so I am a very much a kind of seat of your pants DM. Um, I don't plan anything out beyond maybe two or three sessions. And even that is, I know what we've done previously. I know the story beats that we all, um, I'm kind of getting off topic here a little bit, but in, in kind of this context, like we all kind of talk about what we want to see happen in our own stories for the season. And um, I take all of that and I kind of weave it into whatever my plan is going to be. So it's probably a good hour, hour and a half of just sitting down thinking, what do they want to do? What is my plan for the season? And then just kind of meshing that with the full, again, the full expectation because I know this group so well, that everything is going to go off the rails half an hour in. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think um, everybody's prep time is going to be different. But if you're playing for about two or three hours, I'd give it about half that time. And then if there's a lot more involved, you may want to go a little bit more in depth with that. So for every hour you play, prep for half an hour. That's going to, that's that's my advice. <laughs> It's at least it's a starting point for folks who might just be figuring out how to to budget for this. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Ah, I love this. This was uh, Ranak X. I'm stealing your question because it was similar to what I was about to say. Uh, what is something you know now with your experience in campaign and world building that you wish someone had told you earlier on? Um, I wish that I had known that it really is okay to ask questions. Mm. Like, especially if you're playing in someone else's sandbox. With the Forgotten Realms, everything is kind of, you know, there's a set thing, but the Forgotten Realms is so large that you can just kind of do whatever and uh, change canon and, and, you know, make your own stories. And who cares who the open Lord of Waterdeep is and, 1472 dr it's uh it's laryl silverhand <laughs> something something that i do remember from from uh from last season of, of rivals but um it's totally fine to ask questions and most people are okay with having their canon shaken up just a little bit you know especially if you're trying to create something new something that hasn't because uh, most of my campaign and world building has been done with properties that people have seen a lot of <laughs> so to that to that point it's fine to ask questions about this thing that we have seen and maybe I want to change it up a little bit because everybody's story is different everybody's going to be telling a different story in this place and they're all valid they're all you know they're canon to your universe but I, I do wish that I had known in the, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been so afraid of taking a very small hammer to cannon. <laughs> <laughs> I think that makes a ton of sense. And I love what you alluded to that in terms of finding your DM style, some of it you just had to learn by experience. But if you could sort of hop back to 2016 Latia and be like, try this, try that, consider mm -hmm. this. Uh, do you have any, any tips you'd pass back? Um, be, I'm not going to say be less afraid because that's impossible, but just trust your, trust your instincts and trust your players instincts. Because again, that, that very first time that I DM'd something that was off, that, that had the potential to go off script, which was Lost Minds of Fandelver, my players were just like, yes, go for it. Everything. We trust you. It's all good. And that is extremely liberating and um makes me feel less afraid to do things like that. Ah, I love that so much. 
Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm checking all the things I wanted to know. Now, I am curious specifically because I love the structure that y'all use on Rivals of Waterdeep. I have done mm -hmm. some things with sort of rotating jams before, but mostly they weren't sort of an ongoing story. Um, mm -hmm. And I, so that's a really, really cool structure y'all have hit upon. What have you found about that experience? Is it a, a fun challenge? Does it make it easier, harder, just fun in a different way? It's It's very fun and less difficult than you think it would be. Um, because, you know, as we're passing the torch, so to speak, the previous DM is always more than willing to share. Yeah, this is what I had planned. This is what, you know, we didn't quite get to. Um, this is, you know, willing to share the kind of, the, the, the secrets of their campaign, so to speak. And because we have to kind of continue telling the story, it's very helpful. So. Um, fun fun fact about this. So I also was in the DMC the beginning of 2021 as well. And I was also picking up on the story that Tanya had had for us in the previous session. So I'm not coming in both times I'm I'm hopping into the DMC. I'm not coming in fresh with my own story. I do have to kind of pick up where we left off. And I I'm I'm absolutely 100% okay with that because um, I love wrapping up that story and then finding out how to segue it into what I want to do. Um, but it is a, it's such a unique thing about us that, and I'm not saying that nobody else does this, but it's something that I hadn't seen before, before us. Um, that is just, it's, it's just so unique and fun to kind of like, you know, play this, this leapfrog with, with everybody. And, and of it course it's a wonderful. A... No, go, go oh, ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, it also provides an interesting solve to the age old dilemma of the forever DM. Yes, it does. <laughs> 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 and it's not, we also don't, um, nobody is forced to hop into the seat. You know, it's, do you have an idea? Do you, is there something that, you want to explore something that maybe, you know, you've DM'd a couple seasons back. Is there something in your season that you didn't finish that you'd like to, you know, bring forward into the story? Um, and also, this is another thing. Uh, we're level 17 now. So this is a wholly unique challenge. I've never DM'd tier four content. Ooh. And... Ryan and Eugenio gave us some very unique buffs at the end of the season, which I have to figure out how to get around in terms of combat. <laughs> so I'm super excited. Like it, it, I, I find it both intimidating and extremely exciting to figure out what kind of challenges to present to a group of tier four players. Oh, that's exciting. I will say folks should go check out that season finale, which was streamed live uh, from PAX Unplugged. Yes, it was. The <laughs> best, one of the best tabletop experiences I've ever had. <laughs> oh, I love that. Uh, let's see. We have some more questions coming in. I love yeah, this. Questions. Curio, how do you deal with issues of pacing when it comes to player characters, world events, and story design? Ooh, um, let's talk about that in terms of, in terms of DMing first. We just kind of wing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in, in terms of pacing, I, there are, whenever I go into a stream, there are several things that I want to happen. Or when you sit down at a session, you know, you expect to have some things happen and the most important part of that is hitting those most important beats. Like, um, you know, so at the beginning, so, you know, the, the episode on Sunday, I want to resolve last campaign. I want to set up new campaign. Those are my only two story beats for that. And kind of whatever happens around that pacing is going to just happen because I know my players and I know what we're going to get into. Um, in terms of writing, I'm still figuring that out. 
I trust, I, I, tr- I, I put my ideas into the draft and then I trust my reviewers and editors to say, this is a bit too much. Can maybe this section go somewhere else? Or this is a little too wordy or we need to get them here before this time. And I just kind of, I having a, having a team of people when you're writing is uh, fantastic because then you really don't have to worry about those issues or at least you don't have to worry about them until they tell you that they're issues. I love that. So you can, you can benefit from the collective expertise there in a way that when you're just solo DMing, your, your only editors are basically your players who are going to cut material, whether you like it or not. Uh, mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> it, you know, in the nice way that you can learn a lot about how that stuff flows, but you just have to watch it in action. Um, we also have, let's see, I'm going to save some of these wonderful ones about writing and design for our back half here. Got some great yeah, questions sure. coming in. He squared. So during that winging it part, he squared asks, do you have any advice for preparing for when your party goes somewhere you didn't plan for? And are there ways to plan for that when writing the adventure? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the best thing you can do to prepare for those off script moments is just to know that they're going to go off script. Um. It's it's times like that when having your your list of unused NPC names and places that you may have I may have thought that they would go and they haven't gone but now this random tavern or this random sh- shop is great for this particular detour. Um, but yeah, kind of those those GM tools of 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 your your NPC names, your store names, your your loot tables, your randomness is is are are always going to be very helpful in moments like that so um while you can't fully prepare for those moments it's good to have those random things in your back pocket Mm, so you can also rely on good resources like checking a random loot table or a wandering monsters for a specific area or something like that Mm -hmm. if you need to Mm -hmm. um Folks who have faced this question before have arranged all, all those beautiful books uh, yes. <laughs> that, that we can dip into when we need. Uh, Faymoire Firebird asks, what are some must-discuss topics for a session zero? I love session zeros, and thank you so much for asking this question because they are important and everyone should be doing them. A lot of people are doing them, even if they don't think that they are. Um, you should... Ask all of your players uh, what they expect to get out of the game, the session, the one shot, the whatever um, topics that they want to see, topics that they don't want to see. Um, you don't have to get super detailed with that. A lot of people hear session zero and they're like, I, I don't, I play whatever I want to play at my table, blah, 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 blah. And then it's like, yeah, but still some people at your table have things that they don't want to do and that's fine and if they choose to go to another table because you're not accommodating them don't be mad about that you know Mm. you have something that you want to do and they have something that they want to play and if that's not a good match there's you should not be expected to fit your square puzzle piece into that round slot um but at the very base what does everybody want to get out of this gaming experience what do they want to see? What don't they want to see? And any other things that may come up as a result of those discussions. And take that stuff to heart, actually. Like, don't have a session zero and then throw everything that they've said out of the window. Because one, that shows that you're not listening to them um, and they're not going to have a good gaming experience. But also, they're kind of trusting you to you know, take care of them during this gaming session. And I'm not saying like, you know, it's not therapy or anything like that. Your DMs are not your therapists. Your gaming table is not your therapist. This is a side note, but- We can provide um, meaningful support for each other in many ways, but there is a difference. Yeah. There is absolutely a difference. Um, But it's as simple as, as simple as that. What do you want to get out of this game session? What do you want to see? What don't you want to see? Is there anything that may come up that may terrify you? And I'll avoid that. Or, you know, if there's like, just keeping open communication as well as you continue through the game, because somebody may 
have forgotten to bring something up in your session zero that you touch on during a game. And then it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I actually don't like that. Can we kind of roll that back? Like, um, yeah. I, I like I distill a session zero into those core things that I have just said seven times. What do you want to get out of it? Everybody. What do you like? What don't you like? And the discussion that follows is all you really need for a session zero. You don't have to make a big deal about it. <laughs> well, and I love that because it connects back to what you said about learning as a DM that your players will go with you and you are all there to have a good time together. And these are just ways mm-hmm. to sort of help us set that up to succeed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm also thrilled that this has become a more standard, uh, yeah. more, if you were already doing it now, you kind of have a name for it. And if you weren't doing it, doing you can add it to your process and everybody exactly. kind of wins. Like I, um, I am a subscriber to the belief that the DM is also a player and the DM should be having fun as well. Like there's debate mm-hmm. about that, but I think the DMs are players too. All right. Uh, Kirio, one more from, from our, our top half here. What would you consider, or do you consider, your favorite DM quirk or style that you like to use? Do you have a go-to favorite monster type or magic items or political intrigue? Uh, I, uh, so, so many. My quirk is that I, uh, (laughs) my quirk is that I don't write anything down and I don't know what the plot is until halfway through the game. But what's going on with the wheels behind your head that you're just like, ah, I've figured it out. Is it just because you did enough like Adventures League and pre-published contact that you just know it when it gets there? Sort of, sort of, yes. Um, to put this in to put this into perspective, um, my last season, they went to Candlekeep and it was a mystery. It wasn't one of the Candlekeep mysteries, but it was a mystery. And um this was this was one of those times where it was um I consider it a little bit of a flaw that um, I hadn't had it in the beginning, but in the back half of the season, I realized that the villains were doppelgangers. And I would have liked to have given myself a bit more time to really set that up. Um, But uh, it terrified them enough to now every season we're wondering, uh, are we actually talking to people? Or are we talking to doppelgangers? Are we people or are we doppelgangers? Sharif <laughs> uh, almost says that, uh, Sharif says that I did almost kill them with a giant troll on the way to Waterdeep. And yeah, maybe I did. <laughs> Aaron Lord has a follow up on that, which is oh, oh, Dark of Nate and Aaron Lord take to have a combo. Uh, what was your favorite NPC you ever had to make up on the spot? And then Aaron Lore asks, how do you go about doing that? Do you use random tables or just sort of those prepared lists? Um, so my my favorite character, my favorite NPC that I've had to create up, he wasn't really on the spot. Um, I, I kind of knew that they might end up going to a particular place uh, due to the fact that we have a brain in a jar in a body in our in Troll Skull Manor. Um, but I created Zephyr, who is a... <clears throat> Uh, an artificer who works in the Temple of God in Waterdeep, uh, who uses a wheelchair. Um, he is an ambu- he he is an ambulatory wheelchair user, um, but he's my favorite just because of the fact that I needed somebody who was going to do maintenance on our brain in a jar. <laughs> I love that. There, uh, when a need arises, you're like, ah, yes, this could be a person, and we could love them. Uh, Absolutely. I- a great way to answer any question. Thank you so much for those amazing insights on DM. We're all very excited uh, on DMing. Uh, we're all very excited for the Rivals premiere, which is either in the near future or near past, depending on when you are watching this. Uh, mm-hmm. Sunday, February 6th, I want to say, if I'm doing yes, math Yes, correct. Correct. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, and for your many exciting upcoming things that we will get to more fully talk about. Yeah. Mm-hmm.